Stephen Moffat is back with his first Doctor Who story since Twice Upon a Time. It's called Boom, which sees the Doctor and Ruby caught in the middle of a devastating war. The Doctor is trapped for most of the episode when he steps on a landmine. Can he save himself, Ruby, plus the entire planet without moving? Was it the explosive comeback everyone hoped it'd be? Well, I'm here to discuss that in this week's episode review of Boom. This review will contain spoilers, so if you've not caught up on Boom yet, go and watch it, then come back here. And of course, don't forget to subscribe because I'll be posting season one episode reviews every week. So let's get into Boom. I have to say this was one of the episodes that I was most looking forward to this season. I thought the concept sounded really interesting. It was a really tense episode, so a big shift in tone from episodes one and two, which I think was really good to balance things out a bit because obviously episode one and two were quite silly and it was really good to get an episode which actually was a bit more serious and a bit more dark. So looking at the reactions to the episode, pretty much everyone on well certainly on my social media everyone really liked it you know a lot of people were saying that this was the strongest episode in this new era of russell t davis since wild blue yonder now i don't agree and the reason for that is i thought wild blue yonder was really new you know it was a really new concept it was really unexpected and just on the whole it was just something we never really seen before in Doctor Who. Now I went into Boom with high expectations. It is Stephen Moffat. Stephen Moffat is a great writer and especially under Russell T Davis. He's written some amazing episodes, some classics. So I was really excited to see his return. And of course, as I said before, I really like the concept. I was really excited to see how the Doctor deals with the situation and also how Ruby copes being a bit more sort of on her own. Personally, for me, in comparison to Well Beyonder, I didn't feel Boom was that different to anything we'd seen before, especially in Stephen Moffat's era. And I'll get onto that a bit more later in the review when we talk a bit more about sort of Stephen's writing style and uh, Moffatism. So these are things that come up a lot in Moffat's era. There's just a lot of recognizable content for me anyway. And that might not be that important to a new viewer. So if you haven't seen any of Stephen's writing before, that probably isn't an issue. But a fan like myself who, you know, has followed the series all throughout New Who and all throughout Stephen's era, the episode felt very, very familiar and even predictable in places. There was lots of good stuff, of course, lots of great dialogue, lots of great performances. We'll get onto that a bit more later in the review. And we'll talk a bit about what's coming up later on in the series as well. But first, let's start off talking about the performances in this episode. Now, the concept of the episode was a great way to show Shooty's acting abilities. I think this episode was an absolute standout performance for him. He was given some great dialogue to work with. He got lots and lots of dialogue to work with as well, which was really great to see. And seeing him put under this immense pressure was just such a joy to watch actually. And it was just so great that he had so much to work with. And of course he looked absolutely fantastic as well. I really liked the outfit he was wearing. I think it's interesting that this series we're not really getting a costume for the Doctor or like a single look for the Doctor. I have seen some comments online that this doesn't feel very Doctory, so he sort of just looks a bit like a guy, like especially in next week's episode, um, 73 Yards, he's wearing like a yellow coat. He sort of just looks like a fashionable Londoner uh, in the countryside. But I think it's kind of fun and it also gives fans a lot more opportunities to cosplay. And I'm not being funny, it's great for merchandise as well because think of all the action figures we'll be able to have, all the different variants of the Doctors. So I think that's really exciting. Moving on to Millie Gibson as Ruby. Personally for me, I felt that Ruby didn't have as much to work with in this episode as Shooty did. And I think I expected her to leave the Doctor for a bit and I thought that we would go and follow Ruby, maybe go further into the battlefield or go into the sort of camp where all of the soldiers are, but we don't really do that. It's quite stationary. And I think another thing for me that didn't really sit right with me was some of the dialogue really felt clara s. There was a moment where Ruby disobeys the Doctor and they've only been traveling with each other for six months at this point and she kind of talks him down and says, you know, I'm not gonna, um, throw you this tube of person i'm gonna come up to you and give it to you instead even though it's gonna risk blowing up the landmine i just don't think ruby would do that ruby so far has been really in awe of the doctor and she's new to time travel she's new to this life in the tardis so she really struck me as a person who was really sensible and really trusted the doctor so it sort of was a bit out of the blue for me for ruby to suddenly be like oh no i'm not I'm not going to listen to you all of a sudden. It felt like Stephen was writing dialogue for Clara. And personally for me, I didn't really enjoy Clara and the 12th Doctor's dynamic because Clara was quite dominant in that relationship. 
So when that came up in this episode, I did sort of roll my eyes a bit because I just don't think that's the Ruby that we've got so far. I just don't think it's Ruby and I don't want it to be Ruby. I want Ruby to have her own story. I don't want her to be like Clara. And I think another bit for me that was a bit weird was when she's lying on the ground in the battlefield after being shot and she says, who's my next of kin? Because I thought that her mind initially would have gone to her mum. In previous episodes, she she said, oh, where's my mum? You know, where is she? And, um, you know, she really cares about her foster mum. And it's quite weird that suddenly after six months, she's like, oh, who's my next of kin? And we'll get on to Stephen killing companions and reviving them in the same episode in a bit because that happens as well. Let's move on to Mundy Flynn. Mundy Flynn is played by Varida Seithu. She's going to be coming back soon as a companion. And of course, we don't know how she's going to come back, but Russell did post something yesterday, which I'll read out. He said, it's a delight to welcome Varida to Doctor Who earlier than expected, though things are about to get timey-wimey. That's the end of Monday Flynn's story, so quite how Varida returns will be revealed next year. So it doesn't sound like she's going to be returning as Monday Flynn. It's probably going to be a different character, but why does she look the same? And it also sounds like the new companion played by Varida Seithu might be a present day companion. And personally for me, when Monday popped up, I got really excited because I thought this is the first companion in a while that's been someone who is from the future. Uh, so it sounds like we may get the same actress playing a new companion from Earth. Why they have the same likeness, I guess we'll find out. If you have any theories, let me know in the comments. The battlefield did look pretty good. I know they've used this fancy LED screen to kind of create the depth. If you have a look at Doctor Unleashed, you'll be able to see how they did it. I do think it looks quite good. It does feel quite small at times in terms of scale. And I think considering Disney's involvement, I expected some of these episodes to feel much higher in budget. And compared to the specials, these episodes do feel, I don't know, a little bit more, I want to say low budget, but just like a bit more basic. So maybe they're saving their budget for the finale. Who knows? Now I've got a big section here in my notes about Stephen. So as I said, it was really exciting to have Stephen back writing an episode of Doctor Who. I thought it was a great concept. I thought some of the dialogue was amazing. He does write really good dialogue. He's kind of poetic. He's kind of soppy. And I know a lot of people really like Stephen's style. There's a lot of things that he does that are like trademark Moffatisms. And there were a lot of things that came up in this episode that were just like, yeah, that's Moffat. Moffat, Moffat, Moffat. And as the episode unfolded, particularly when I saw the child, there was a child and then obviously the dad character, I just had an inkling that this is going to be a parental love saves the day story. And it was, it made it feel a little bit predictable and it wasn't too different to what we've seen before, which is why I don't think it's comparable to Wobbly Yonder. Wobbly Yonder was just completely, for me anyway, it was completely, completely different. It was fresh and it was exciting. But this episode, it just, it felt, for me, it felt a bit predictable. And I just found the whole child storyline a bit annoying. I felt the child was a little bit annoying. I felt like she was just a device to make stuff happen sometimes. So like she was sort of just in the way. She's a bit clumsy. And I don't think it was really needed. I think she was only in there to facilitate the storyline about parental, uh, well, parent power, as the doctor says, and the sort of parental love storyline. I actually think we didn't need that. You could have got rid of that entirely. And I really liked the bit where the Doctor was talking to Monday, Monday Flynn, about just surrendering. You know, this episode was actually meant to be a statement about capitalism, about weapons manufacturers, and about how in the future people have got so greedy that they've created and invented imaginary wars so they can make money. And they're using AI to do that. I think that in itself is strong enough. And I think the love story with Monday and the other guy, I think after that point, after he gets shot, I thought, oh yeah, she's gonna surrender. I thought she was gonna be the one to stop the war. And I thought that in the end would have resolved the episode. But in the end, it's it's this thing with the girl. I just don't think you needed it. You could have got rid of that entirely. And the doctor, the beauty of the doctor is he uses words as his weapon. He doesn't carry guns. And I really thought that he was gonna be able to talk her down and get her, you know, convince her to surrender. That's why I thought this was going. And in the end, it was just this child. But let me know what you guys think in the comments, because of course, I know a lot of people really enjoyed this episode. I have actually written a list of a few other things that I think are like the Moffatisms that come up. So kills a companion and then resurrects said companion. Religion, so making the church an army. Religious stuff comes up quite a lot in Moffat's episodes. Dialogue, I guess uh, Stephen is, a, you know, a bit of a soppy git at times. And, you know, he does write quite poetic dialogue. So, you know, snow isn't snow until it falls 
what survives of us is love. I mean, come on. I do like the dialogue. It is really quotable, but it is also Stephen's signature dialogue. There was a bit of romance, you know, Monday Flynn and Canto. The big one is love saves the day. Everybody lives. It's, uh, you know, it's like parental love specifically saves the day. I know I said in my last review that it is okay to reuse stuff at this point. It has been 20 years of new who so you can afford to get away with it for new audiences but as i said for me as a fan who you know has followed the series this didn't feel very new to me and i guess another thing is a companion appearing before they start traveling with the doctor so we had that with clara who played oswin she appeared and then later on came back as clara the companion bossing the doctor around so as i said the sort of clara-esque dialogue it sort of didn't really sit right with me i felt that was very very moffaty and i think stephen was having quite a lot of fun with this episode with all of the references so there's references to the long way round fish fingers and custard there's an amy reference where the uh, machine scans her and says that she's a few thousand years old um i guess the snow twice upon a time the snow freezing and there's quite a few other references as well so stephen was definitely having fun with that i don't want to slate stephen too much in this review because he is a great writer and he is a great guy and i know a lot of fans really like his style of writing the moffat girlies will be thriving but for me personally as a fan when i went into this episode i really didn't know what to expect and i really had high hopes for this episode and i think when i started seeing the sort of classic Moffat things coming back and the kind of parental love storyline. There was part of me that kind of felt a little bit underwhelmed and a bit unexcited because I felt like I've seen it all before. But all in all, I think it was a really strong episode by itself and I'm sure new fans going into it will absolutely love this. Now, before we wrap up this review, I just want to introduce a new format to these reviews. We're gonna be diving into the crystal ball which means we're going to be looking at some predictions for what's to come. I don't have my physical crystal ball with me, so we're going to have to imagine there's one here. So firstly, I want to call out Susan Twist. This is probably the most we've seen of her so far. And actually, this is also the first time the doctors properly faced her and talked to her. I have my suspicions that Susan Twist might just be an actor that's being reused. I don't know why. I just suddenly started to have my doubts. I thought maybe this is something Russell's just playing with. It's a bit of a red herring. Maybe he's just doing it for fun. I don't know. I really hope it's not that because I'm really reinvested in who she is. And I think looking forward to next week, 73 yards, potentially the person that's stalking Ruby is her. The next one I want to talk about is the trickster. So there have been a lot of theories about the trickster's return as the one who waits. And I think this is highly, highly likely. All you need to do is look at episodes of the Sarah Jane adventures that feature the trickster. And you can see some similarities so for example in the temptation of sarah jane the trickster turns up and sets a trap for sarah jane to go back to the date her parents died and of course sarah jane does go back in time to see her parents and as a result it creates an alternate timeline so ruby's birth could be a trap that's being set up by the trickster i've seen some other theories out there that ruby could potentially be the child of the trickster and i think one of the things that's really interesting is in the devil's cord where she floats up in the air and she's got all the notes around her there's a sound that you can hear just before the main song plays the shepherds i don't know the chorus whatever it is there's a tune that plays which is very similar to the theme of the trickster have a listen that's what i am asking you just So there's a couple of little things in there that could hint to the trickster's return. Let me know what you think in the comments because I'd love to know your theories. So looking ahead to next week, we've got the episode 73 Yards, which looks really, really exciting and really tense and really scary. Really excited to see this episode. It looks like we might get a Dr. Light episode. Usually in Russell's era, we get a Dr. Light episode once per season. So maybe this is the Dr. Light episode. So I'm really excited for that. It looks really, really scary. I'll actually be watching the episode at MCM Comic Con next weekend. So if any of you guys are headed there, look out for me. Do say hi. I'll be walking around on Friday and Saturday doing uh, some interviews and things like that. And Saturday evening, there is a screening and q a with some of the people who work on the show i've just had a look at the link and i think there are actually still tickets available so if you are headed to mcm and you want to go and watch 73 yards and a panel click the link in my bio hopefully there'll still be tickets available by the time this review goes out there's also going to be a doctor who stand at mcm similar to previous years selling merchandise and exclusive merchandise titan have actually given me some products to preview so we will be taking a look at these on this channel thanks so much for watching this review i'll be back next week with a review of 73 yards let me know what you thought of Boom and I'll see you next week.